When this tumor mass needs a blood supply and signals to the capillary to bud and bring a, a, a blood vessel to the tumor, blood supply, nutrients, oxygen, that's angiogenesis. That's a copper-dependent process. You will see the tumor signals the liver to release copper from the storage molecule seruloplasmin. And you will see seruloplasmin and copper go up in the serum. And this is a, is a sign that angiogenesis is happening. <coughs> Remember that seruloplasmin is also an acute phase reactant in inflammation, so you have to take everything in context. If they also have an infection, maybe that's why their seruloplasmin is high. So these are not cancer markers. These are physiologic biomarkers. So you have to take everything in context and say, what does it mean? But if you see this constellation of all these factors that I'm bringing to your attention today make a pattern, then you think cancer. <clears throat> so angiogenesis, of course, is a normal process. We want angiogenesis. You have surgery, you have an accident, you need to bring blood vessels into the injured area and repair that incision or that injury. So we don't want zero angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is not pathologic inherently. So the uh, fact of cancer is that tumor cells co-opt our normal physiologic processes to accomplish their goals and needs. And so they're not making up new physiology, they're just uh, taking as hostage our normal processes. So this initiation of angiogenesis is one of the steps of disease progression and acceleration. So creating an environment where this is contained is very powerful. And we actually do this in stage three and four cancer patients where angiogenesis and metastasis has already occurred. So stage one is when you have primarily local disease. Stage two is when you have invasion of the lymph nodes. Stage three and four, when you get progression to other sites in the body, and there is no stage five. So usually in stage three and four patients, oncologists also are running out of ideas. And so we want to say, okay, how can we contain the disease without toxicity? So controlling copper and thereby controlling angiogenesis is a mechanism. So this is what happens. You have this tumor cell developing in isolation in the tissue, and it all of a sudden it gets hypoxic because it's replicated to the point where the center is not getting any nutrients or any oxygen. A smaller cell will just uh, have <clears throat> membrane access to the environment, to nutrients, to oxygen. Uh, just like a, a little single-celled organism. As it gets bigger, it needs more nutrients to grow. So it sends the signal out to the capillary, and the capillaries start to move towards the tumor, and boom, you got a blood supply, and now you can grow. That's what happens. So in that context, once you have a tumor cell with a good blood supply, then the specialized metastatic cells in that mass, some of them have enzymes that can break through the blood vessel wall, can break through into the extracellular matrix, then break through into another larger blood vessel and travel. And then when they get to a nice place, a new neighborhood, they want to have a new condominium, then they do the same thing in reverse and start growing there. And so we want to inhibit this process. The places where metastasis is most common are the highly vascular areas of, of the body, where there's more blood vessels. And no one ever dies of a primary tumor, for the most part. It is metastatic disease that kills cancer patients. So if we can really contain that and prevent a major organ from being taken over by a tumor mass and thereby damaging important functions. So if you lose liver function, lung capacity, uh, if your brain is filled with metastatic lesions, you know, you're in trouble. You're gonna lose important function that allows you to live. So uh, you could have a breast cancer patient who gets metastasis to the brain or metastasis to the bone or to the liver. And once those organs are taken over, 
then it's not possible to sustain life. So again, the more we can contain tumor progression, travel, and just size, patients can live with metastatic disease for quite a long time if we can control it. So inhibiting copper's impact on angiogenesis is a mechanism for doing that, okay? And so there are really, really a lot of studies now. There's, um, we've been doing uh, oral copper chelation, reducing copper uh, levels for decades in naturopathic medicine, but there were some studies that came out in about the last five years. There was a big study that came out at Cornell. There's a researcher named Vadat, and she's done a lot of this. And then I had papers to put in front of oncologists and say, see, we have to do this. And now I have oncologists that will prescribe tetrathiomolybdate, an oral copper chelating agent, and uh, this actually stops patients from progressing. And so there's no uh, kill rate to the tumor cell when you inhibit angiogenesis by any means, whether it's a drug or copper chelation. But uh, you just stop disease progression. So for example, I have a patient who was diagnosed at stage three with very aggressive breast cancer. It had metastasized to her bone. And those kinds of patients are really high risk for disease progression and um, more metastasis. And she had really high copper levels. So we have had her on uh, copper control for a long time. She would be expected in the, the conventional oncology setting to progress, to have progressive metastatic disease and die from it. She's just hit her, I think, her six-year mark. She still has, if you do a scan on her, she still has hot spots, but they're not doing anything. So that's my point. How can we use relatively non-toxic, safe methods to just contain the disease? She will probably live quite a long time. So it's important to tell patients that who have advanced disease, like, well, you know, we don't have to blast you with a lot of toxic drugs, we could just control this the way we might control diabetes. And so it psychologically reframes it for the patient, which I think is really, really important. So uh, lots and lots and lots of studies on this. Um, there's one here, here it is, that actually uses the word curative. This I like to put in front of oncologists because in advanced cancer patients, the language is palliative, not curative. Uh, oncologists will decide if their treatment is palliative or curative based on whether or not they really think they can give the patient a long run with no evidence of disease. So here's an opportunity to do that. So if we lower copper in a patient who's had good successful reduction of their tumor burden by whatever means, surgery, chemo, immunotherapy, whatever it is, and then we track their copper, keeping copper in the lowest quartile of normal, usually their disease does not progress. I've had patients on uh, copper control for years and years and years, and their disease that would be expected to progress doesn't. So uh, this is pretty interesting. Where the remaining disease is micrometastatic, TM therapy appears to be curative, and I'm gonna tell you what TM is in a moment. But that's a pretty powerful statement to be published in a medical journal. So there's lots more studies on this. Uh, also, you reduce inflammation when you reduce copper. So you get that benefit as well. So I have lots and lots of studies to support this. And I make a little uh, folder for oncologists and give this to them. And uh, some of these are, are big studies. There's, um, here's a study here with uh, patients over a two-year period with both uh, stage two, three, and stage four disease. And look at the results, 91%, 67% control of the disease. This is triple negative breast cancer, which is a difficult to treat breast cancer that often recurs. It's very aggressive, not very responsive to treatment. So you often see, it's a pretty inflammatory breast cancer also. So you often see these patients with high copper.
hope you'll join me for my comprehensive Foundations of Integrative Oncology course, which includes monthly live grand round calls with me where you can ask your questions. You can start transforming your practice today so that you can become the go-to expert who is truly prepared for the rising tide of cancer patients and survivors who are looking for a skilled and knowledgeable clinician who can provide them with the health side of the cancer equation and help them take control of their health and support them through all phases of the cancer journey and beyond. Click on the link below now to get immediate access to all of the modules, print-on-demand patient support documents, and quick reference clinician guides, as well as learn how this course has transformed the way other clinicians like you practice.